Uh, hey everyone, uh, let's get started. Uh, today I'm the speaker. My name is Vaibhav Gujral and I'm going to talk on Azure Governance 101. I would like this uh, session to be uh, interactive. I would be covering lots of topics today, so if you have any questions or if you have want to discuss anything in between, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. Uh, I have over 14 years of experience and I'm a Microsoft certified Azure Solutions Architect. I'm currently working for Kivit as a cloud architect. I am also an organizer at this very user group, which has over 800 community members in Meetup. As an organizer, I do organize user group meetings and manage the user group's website, social media presence, and the Meetup page as well. Like this particular user group, I'm also a regular speaker at several other user groups and events, often speaking on Azure related topics. I also blog on uh, webofgujral.com. Uh, my blog has been listed among top 50 uh, Microsoft Azure blogs, websites, and influence, influencers in 2020. I'm also being awarded with Azure Heroes Community Hero and Content Hero Badgers based on my contributions in Azure Tech Community. You can follow me on Twitter or you can connect with me over LinkedIn. Enough about me. Let's jump onto the agenda and see what we are going to talk today. When we speak of Azure Governance, there is a lot that falls under it. I have many topics that I want to talk about, uh, ranging from resource hierarchy in Azure, management groups, subscriptions, resource groups. We'll touch upon different governance constructs like policies, blueprints, RBAC, resource graph, and so on. Towards the end, the most important piece, Azure cost management uh, that we are going to touch upon. Just a level setting here. This is a level 100 session uh, where I will provide you enough information to get started with each of these services, but we won't be uh, digging deep into or taking a deep dive into any of these services. All right, let's move on. Uh, it's important to first talk about Azure Resource Manager or ARM um, before we talk about anything. Uh, Azure Resource Manager is a declarative template based repeatable deployment model. In a nutshell, it's a JSON based deployment model to provision the instances of Azure resource types like virtual machines or SQL databases or app, app services. Using ARM, all the Azure resources can be grouped, deployed, managed, and monitored as an entity known as resource group. Under each resource group, all the resources share the same life cycle. ARM template can be reused any number of times to deploy the same set of resources. And uh, we can link or nest multiple ARM templates with each other to make a composite ARM template as well. The major advantage we get out of ARM model is, first of all, it is the cloud native way of uh, deploying Azure resources. Secondly, it also allows us to define dependencies between resources and ARM, um, meaning if resource A has dependency upon resource B to exist before resource A can be created, we can manage that sort of dependency in Azure Resource Manager. Here's a glimpse of how Azure Resource Manager works. You have Azure Resource Manager in the middle which manages the underlying resource types like web apps, virtual machines, and uh, SQL, data, SQL databases, and so on. There are different ways to manage your Azure resources. Uh, based on Azure Resource Manager, you, the tool, there are a lot of management tools like Azure Portal, Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI, REST APIs. And then we can also use third party tools like Terraform and so on, which uh, can connect to Azure Resource Manager provider and we can utilize those tools to provision and deprovision the underlying resource types. Now let's talk about the resource hierarchy within Azure. As I mentioned in the last slide, different Azure resources are grouped together into a logical construct known as a resource group. Resource group sits under an Azure subscription, which is a logical container for all your Azure resources. An Azure subscription is then tied to a single Azure AD tenant. And then on the very top, we have management groups which provide a level of scope above subscriptions. Just like how resource groups are groupings of resources, management groups are groupings of subscriptions. The idea behind this resource or scope hierarchy is to provide a cleaner way to manage and govern Azure environments. You can apply different compliance policies at any of these scopes. Uh, 
uh, and the policies are inherited by the underlying scopes. We'll see how it works, but uh, to cite an example, if we apply a policy at a subscription level, it is being inherited by all the underlying resource groups and resources within it. If we apply a policy at a management group level, it is being inherited by all the underlying subscriptions and the corresponding resource groups and resources. And so uh, let's let's talk about management groups. Management groups allow us to group our subscriptions into logical containers, as I was mentioning in my last slide. Uh, you can have nested management groups, meaning a management group can be created under another management group. Of course, we can have subscriptions under any management group. Management groups actually remove the need to manage or govern individual subscriptions. If you have been utilizing Azure since last four, five, six years, the you would remember that there was no concept of management groups earlier. And if we was, we used to try to, in, uh, if we used to apply policies, the only scope available was at the subscription level. So for in, for assigning a policy at a subscription level, it was a painful job. We had to assign it at multiple subscriptions. Using management groups, now we can group all the different subscriptions within a management group, and rather than applying at individual subscription level, we can apply those policies or uh, constructs at the at a higher level, at a management group level, so that it is inherited by all the underlying subscriptions. Now. Uh, Whenever we uh, whenever we set up our Azure accounts or Azure subscriptions, there is a root group or a root management group which gets created by default, which is known as tenant root group. You can create new management groups under this root management group and organize your subscriptions in any order you prefer. You cannot change or delete the tenant root group is something to be well noted. And likewise, once you have created a management group, do note that you cannot change its name. You can change its display name, though. And as I mentioned in my uh, last slide for the resource hierarchy, all the policies that you define in a management group automatically gets applied to all the underlying management groups and subscriptions. We'll see in an upcoming slide how it looks like. Uh, you can use Azure Portal, uh, Azure PowerShell, Azure CLI to create or delete a management group, adding or removing subscriptions from a management group. I will show it in a demo how we can do it. Within our management group, we have an Azure subscription, which is a logical container for your Azure resources. As I was showing earlier, an Azure subscription contains resource groups, which contain the related Azure resources together. Each Azure resource can be associated with one and only one subscription, and each subscription can be associated with only one management group. Each Azure subscription is linked to an Azure Active Directory tenant, which is used for authentication and authorization. An Azure subscription also behaves as a billing boundary, uh, which is linked to an Azure offer, which defines the pricing and the other benefits you get through your Azure subscriptions. I will show it to you in an demo soon. It's important to note here is that each Azure subscription comes with its own defined scale limits for different resource types. For example, the number of cores that you can use in your compute services in your subscription or the number of storage accounts that you can have in your subscription and so on. In a nutshell, it behaves as a boundary of scale. It is very critical to be aware of subscription scale limits where you, when you are defining your resource hierarchy for your Azure environment. Likewise, an Azure subscription also acts as an administrative boundary, which we are going to see shortly, where we can apply security and governance constructs like Azure policies and Azure role-based access control roles. Now, when I was mentioning that Azure subscription is a billing boundary, it is important to understand what does that translates into. Whenever you create an Azure subscriptions, it is assigned a particular account offer type. There are three primary account offer types that you would have uh, seen in your subscriptions. It would be one of these. To start with, uh, as an individual user, you can sign up for a free account to receive a $200 credit uh, with one month validity. Apart from $200 credit, it also gives you access to certain services which are free for 12 months. 
After the 12 months, these services convert into pay as you go usage. And I believe uh, there are 25 plus services which are always free, which can be checked out in the uh, Azure documentation. The next option uh, and the next of account of a type is pay as you go account. As the name suggests, you pay for whatever services you consume. You can directly create a pay as you go account or you can convert your free account into one after your free credit is utilized. To sign up for free trial, you need to provide a credit card, but do note that it's Microsoft doesn't charges you for uh, anything on your credit card under free uh, tier. They only utilize a credit card for identity verification purpose. In pay as you go subscription, you have to provide a credit card because I, um, Microsoft charges you for based on your usage and they bill your credit card that you provide at the time of your subscription creation. Lastly, you can also utilize Visual Studio subscription, uh, which comes as part of MSDN subscriptions or Visual Studio subscriptions uh, through your employer or you can purchase on your own for personal use. Depending upon the uh, subscription level, you get $50 or $150. Uh, credit in your Azure subscription, which you can utilize against any resource type. One more thing to understand in context with Azure subscriptions is the different billing account types. So don't uh, mix this with the account offer types. When you sign up for an Azure account, it automatically creates a billing account for one of the types for you to manage invoices, payments and track costs. There are three billing account types as listed there. To start with, it's my the first one is Microsoft Online Services Program, uh, which uh, you get when you sign up for an Azure subscription directly through Azure portal. Now, if you work for an enterprise, you will know that enterprises have something known as an enterprise agreement with Microsoft, not only to cover Azure costs, but to cover all the Microsoft services that an enterprise consumes. So if you work for an organization like that, they fall under enterprise agreement uh, account type. And lastly, if you uh, if you or your organization work with a Microsoft representative to sign a Microsoft customer agreement, you might get a billing account type of Microsoft customer agreement. I'll tell you why it's important in the later slides. So I know most of you would be confused here then uh, that I have been talking between Azure subscription and Azure account. What's the difference between the two? So as a summary of my couple of my last slides, here's the takeaway. There is something known as an Azure billing account and there is something known as an Azure subscription. An Azure billing account is created when you sign up to use Azure. It is used to manage your invoices, payments and track costs. You can also have access to multiple billing accounts within your environment. On the other hand, Azure subscription is a logical container used to provision resources in Azure. When you sign up for an Azure account, an Azure subscription is created by default. There can be multiple subscription under a billing account essentially. And any Azure resource that you create in Azure must be created within a subscription. It, that's a, a condition. As I was telling in the earlier slide, when you this is how it looks like when you create an Azure account or a billing account, uh, all the invoicing and payment information is reflected under that account. Under a billing account, there could also be different billing profiles and invoicing sections for different departments and different uh, uh, divisions whatsoever. The hierarchy depends purely on your organizational hierarchy. At the lowest level, you can see the different Azure subscriptions, which are not only the logical containers for your Azure services, but they are the actual payment agreements. Uh, remember, I was saying that Azure subscriptions are also billing boundaries. That is why uh, based on this hierarchy, they are. That's why they are called payment boundaries. So when you create a subscription, you are required to provide payment methods like credit card number, which is again tied up to your particular billing profile and invoice section, which is tied up to your billing account. Feel free if you uh, have any questions, feel free to interrupt me in between or you can post your questions on the chat window. Moving on, uh, we have talked about management group. We have talked about subscriptions and 
we have talked that management groups are the top level scopes, which is a grouping of subscriptions. Subscriptions are grouping of logical groupings for resources, but when we actually create an Azure resource within Azure, it actually goes and sits in something known as a resource group, which is a part of an Azure subscription. So within an Azure subscription, all the Azure resources that you create are essentially grouped into one or more resource groups. All the resources within a resource group share the same life cycle. That's the primary uh, intent behind creating those resource groups. A resource can only be assigned to one resource group at a time. Most types of resources can be moved to a res different resource group at any time, which is a very common scenario. You create a resource in a particular resource group and then you have to move it to a different resource group, which is doable for most of the services, but there are dependencies sometimes across different resources which blocks doing that. Now the resources in a resource groups can be in different regions or different locations, which is absolutely fine. When you create a resource group, you define a location for your resource group as well. Your resource location and your resource groups location doesn't need to be the same. You can have your resource group located in central US and your resources could be in East US or it could be in Asia, it could be in Australia as well. You can use a resource group to control access for the re resources within that resource group and do note that resource group is just like just like subscription. It's a logical contain. It's a logical container and neither subscription nor logical and uh, neither subscription nor resource group. They don't cost anything. What really cost is the actual Azure resources that are created within the resource group. So Pawan has asked the question saying, where does the management group come in the previous hierarchy? So I have this slide where I have shown the hierarchy, how it shows. And uh, if you are asking about this hierarchy, it doesn't come, management groups doesn't come in this hierarchy at all. This is, this is completely a billing hierarchy or a payment hierarchy and management groups doesn't have any, any representation in this hierarchy. And you won't see this in your Azure portal environment as well. What you will indeed see is this where you will have a tenant root management group under that you can create your own management groups and then you can have your subscriptions. It is very important to understand this resource hierarchy in Azure because this is what you will see in your Azure portal as I was telling earlier. In this diagram what you see is a real world example of a scenario where we have three different environments, two for non-production and one for production. As you can see, there is a tenant root group which is tied to Azure AD tenant and cannot be deleted. Under the tenant root group, there are two management groups, one for non-production and one for production. Under the non-production management group, there are two subscriptions, the dev one and QA subscription. And under the production management group, you have a production subscription. Under the dev and QA subscription, they have their respective resource groups. Each one of them have their own respective resources pretty straightforward one important thing you shall understand here about azure resource or scope hierarchy is that if you apply any as any governance construct or on a particular scope like a management group or a subscription or a resource group it is inherited by all the underlying resources meaning if i apply a construct at root management group it is applied across the complete environment if I go ahead and apply a construct only at dev subscription, it is inherited only by the dev subscription resources and not by others. Pawan, I guess I answered your question. Let me know if you have any other question. So moving on, uh, as I was saying earlier when I was talking about management groups, that uh, we can have nested management groups. It's not necessary to just have subscriptions in your management group. You can actually have management groups as well within your management groups. Uh, the only uh, restriction that you should be aware is that you can only have 10,000 management groups at maximum, which in my opinion is very big number. Having 10,000 management groups will in itself uh, give you management issues. In this diagram, I have extended the resource hierarchy from the last, last slide further. What you see here is that we have two different uh, two different management groups under the tenant root group now. One is for IT department and the other one is for HR department. Within the IT department, we had similar to the last slide, two different uh, environments, production and non-production, and we have respective uh, 
management groups there and within each of them quite similar to what i was showing in earlier slide but under hr uh, management group we have an hr subscription and the hr resource groups and hr resources we can further take it a step further in that direction we can also have a management group for geographies what i have done here is within it management group i have created two different management groups one for south central us and the other one for central us under under south central us management group i can put all my resources which are running in south central likewise i can put all my resource groups and subscriptions running in central under the central us management group let's let's jump onto the azure portal quickly and see how it all works out so uh, i have visual studio enterprise subscriptions under my name so this is where when you go to management groups blade within your azure portal that is how your tenant root groups show up if you will go in the inside tenant root group all your management groups and hierarchy or your subscriptions will show up there I have a Visual Studio subscription which sits under directly under tenant root group. I have created another management group called my management group under the tenant root group, which has my other subscription. And I also have another management group. I don't have any further subscriptions, but I can keep on creating these hierarchies back to back. Now within each of these subscriptions, if I will go in my subscription, I have different resource groups and one of these resource group I'm running my user groups website as well. So if I go inside that I can see all the different resources that I have for my resource group. So the hierarchy is we have our tenant root group within which we have our subscription within subscription. We have resource group within resource group. We have our resources. Now um, I will touch upon it in coming slides and coming demos, but let's take an example if I go ahead and go to access control which is how we provide role based access control to individual users and if i go ahead here and add uh, give someone permission here i can add users in here and give them appropriate roles and since i'm giving the permissions on the tenant root group the permissions will be inherited across the underlying management groups subscriptions and resource groups as well all right let's uh, talk about azure policies Azure policies are set of rules that you can define to enforce organizational standards and assessing compliance to those standards. Uh, for example, uh, as part of your organizational standard, you might only allow specific resource types or you might uh, require all the resources to be deployed in specific locations. You can do so do that through Azure policies. Azure policies continuously scan the underlying Azure resources in your environment and provide compliance reports in a dashboard. It also offers remediation steps to fix the non-compliant resources in your environment. As I was saying, examples could be allowed resource types in your subscription, which allows provisioning of specific resource types like virtual machines, web apps, SQL databases, and so on. You can uh, restrict the locations to which you can uh, users can de provision resources in. You can choose the different virtual machine sizes that the users can opt from. And likewise, you can have any any policy that reflects that enforces your organizational standard. You can either create custom policies for your specific use case, or you can also opt from built in policies offered by Azure. Uh, there are a bunch of built in policies that Azure comes with, including the examples that I have mentioned in the last slide, like allowed resource types, allowed locations and so on. Uh, I have listed a link down below which lists all the built in policies. Uh, go, uh, please check that out and uh, see what you can use for your organizational environment. Uh, when you are assigning policies, you have two different options to opt from. Uh, you can either create individual policies and assign them at different scopes like management groups or subscriptions. Alternatively, if you have a number of policies that needs to be applied at the same scope, you can create uh, something known as an initiative, which is nothing but a collection of individual policies. All the policies within an initiative, as you would have guessed already, behave as a group and are applied together on the assigned scope. 
Then you create Azure policies. There are three different parts that you shall define, namely policy definition, policy assignment, and policy parameters. Policy definition, as the name indicates, defines the condition on which the policy will report on, like the allowed locations or the allowed resource types or the allowed SKUs, uh, SKUs or whatever your policy is about. Policy assignment is where you assign the policy to a scope. For example, if I want to restrict users in my one of my subscriptions to deploy resources only in allowed locations, I can choose, I can assign that particular policy to that particular scope of that subscription. And do note that the moment I apply, uh, assign a policy to a, a scope, it is inherited by the underlying resource groups, resources and whatsoever. Lastly, policy parameters, uh, which is a great tool, I believe uh, they help uh, you to parameterize your policy so that you can pass some values, which in other case you might have to hard code. The advantage you get out of parameterizing your policy definitions is that you can then reduce duplicate policies. So what happens is you define parameters at the time of policy definition, and then you pass the actual values for those parameters at the time of policy assignments. I'll showcase that in a demo shortly. Similar to a policy and initiative, as I said, uh, is a collection of policies, and it also has three different uh, parts, definition, assignment, and parameters. Uh, similar to policies and initiative definition defines the group of policies that are part of the initiative. Assignment and parameters behave the same way like policies. As I was mentioning earlier, the advantage you get out of using initiatives is that it greatly reduces management of policies. Just like policies, you can create your own initiatives or you can use the Azure provided built in ones as well. For the complete list of Azure provided built in initiatives, I have provided a link down below there. Do check it out. Essentially, a policy definition is a JSON based template. When you define a policy, you have to write JSON, which has four main sections. You, uh, you define the different properties for the policy like name type, if it is a custom or built in, etc. Then you provide the parameters that you need values at the time of assignment. Parameters, as I was saying, allow you to use the same policy definition across different scopes. For example, in this case, I can apply this very policy definition on two different subscriptions and I can have completely different list of allowed SKUs for both these scopes. In a nutshell, parameters promote reusability. The next section that you need to define in your policy definition uh, is the rule which defines the condition that needs to be evaluated. And as you can see here in this particular example, it checks for all the virtual machine resource types and checks for the SKU names against the list of allowed SKUs. And once the rule that is defined there is evaluated, an effect defines what happens as the outcome. And each poly policy definition has to has an effect. In this particular example, the effect is deny. So what this overall policy definition does is if, if the policy ev rule evaluates true for the policy defined against the assigned scope, it denies the request. Meaning if anyone tries to create a virtual machine, which is not from the allowed SKU types that you have uh, listed here in the parameters for your Azure policy definition, then it simply denies the request creation or the creation request for that. Arun does ask, does implementing policy depends on level of Azure subscription? Does implementing policy depends on level of Azure subscription? I didn't follow your question correctly, Arun. Can you elaborate a bit? What do you mean by level of Azure subscription? Do you mean the account types or the offer types? If you meant the offer types, I don't think so. It, it depends on that. Now, as I was saying in this, uh, slide that the uh, outcome of a policy definition is defined through an effect. An effect could be have seven diff one of the seven different values. It could have append, audit, audit if not exist, deny, deploy, deploy if not exist, disabled or modify. Uh, append is used to add additional fields to the requested resource during creation or update. 
For example, if I want to add a firewall rule every time a SQL server is created, I can utilize append effect which in my policy. So what happens is in my policy, if it will evaluate if someone is trying to create a SQL server in Azure without a firewall rule using the append effect, I can actually get that firewall, firewall rule added. Audit is used to create a warning event in the activity log when evaluating a non-compliant resource. But the best part is it doesn't stop the request. For example, if I want to audit all the existing virtual machines against the specific rule, like uh, they should be off, they should belong to the allowed SKUs or they should be in allowed location, uh, and I just want to audit that, I can use audit effect. Similar to audit, we also have audit if not exist, which um, has an existence condition defined within that, or uh, based on which it. It audits when there is no related resource that exists based on the that existence condition. For example, if I want to audit all the extensions on a virtual machine that doesn't exist, I can utilize audit if not exist. Deny, as the name suggests, is used to prevent a resource request that doesn't match defined standards through a policy definition and fails the request. And similar to audit if not exist, deploy if not a deploy if not exists deploys a resource when the existence condition is evaluated false. So under both deploy not uh, deploy if not exist and audit if not exist, I believe you have to specify an existence condition. And for deploy if not exist, you also have to provide a remediation task. Disabled is used for disabling a single assignment instead of disabling all the assignments. The advantage you get out of it is uh, it's similar to an audit effect, but rather than just disabling the all the assignments, you can control that at a single assignment level. Lastly, modify is used for adding, updating, or removing tags on your resources. Now you will ask the difference between modify and append. Modify is exactly similar to how append works, but modify is recommended only for tags, and for everything else, append shall be used. And before uh, I jump on to the next slide, it is important to understand the sequence of how these policy effects are evaluated. Uh, disabled is checked first and foremost to determine if the policy role should be evaluated. And if it is enabled and it should be evaluated, then it goes and evaluates append or modify effect. Then deny last effect that is evaluated is audit. So let's touch upon the scope hierarchy again that we have talked about earlier. So if I go ahead and apply a policy at my root management group, it gets inherited at all the underlying resources. In this case, but the policy is inherited by both the production and the non-production management groups and the underlying subscriptions and resource groups and the resources. Uh, when we are assigning a policy, though there is a exclusion tab where we can actually exclude some of these underlying resources if at all we want to. For example, in this particular example, if I want to exclude QA subscription and the and the underlying resources from the policy assignment, I can do so. But by default, if I assign, and this is how it behaves. Likewise, if I apply a policy on the only on the production management group, it is inherited by all the underlying subscriptions and resources, but not by the non-production management group and the underlying resources. Let's go and look into Azure policies. So I'm into my management group screen right now. So under that, there, there are two ways you can go and look into policies. The first way is you can go under the policy. You can click on the policy uh, blade under tenant root group here, or you can also go and click on the policy on the menu. So once you go into menu, it will give you an overview slide, overview blade, where it will give you the overall compliance that your environment has against the defined policies. As you can see on the left side under authoring section, you have a couple of um, blades. One is definitions, where you can define your policies. As you can see, there are different filters you can apply here under definition types. As I was saying, it could be an initiative, which is a group of policies, or it could be an individual policies. You can have built-in policies which are offered by Microsoft, or you can have custom policies. 
and you can further categorize them based on different categories. For example, I can have policies for virtual machines. I can have different policies for app services, for SQL databases, and so on. You can go ahead and choose your scope as well here, depending upon you can choose the management group or the subscription and see the policies which are applied to each of those scopes. As you will see, I will I don't have any custom policy here, but if I go ahead and choose built in policies here, you can see the different category of policies which are offered by Microsoft, which I can go ahead and utilize them. So let's start with a default one, a common one which we have. Let's say let me find SKU. So we have a built in policy called allowed virtual machine size SKUs, which is in a built in policy, which is under compute category. If I go ahead and open that, as I said, the policy definition is a JSON template. And as you will see, it has all those four different sections. It has the properties defined, which say gives the display name, the policy type, the description and so on. It then has the parameters. This particular policy takes the list of the allowed SKUs that we can choose at the time of assignment. Then this is the policy rule that it evaluates. What it is doing is essentially I had the screenshot of this in my slide deck as well. It's checking the uh, virtual machines SKU name property against the list of the allowed SKUs that we pass at the time of assignment. And finally, the effect is deny. If I go ahead and assign this to one of the scopes, it will start denying any new creation requests for virtual machines which are outside of the allowed SQ list that I provide. As you can see here, there is no assignment because I have not assigned it anywhere yet. It has a single parameter allowed as size SKUs, which is of kind uh, type array because it's a list of SKUs that I can allow for my environment. I can click on assign and go ahead and apply on a particular scope. I can choose a particular scope. Let's say if I go ahead and choose my tenant root group as a scope. As I was saying, there is an option we can choose exclusion. Let's say I want to only apply for one of my subscriptions and not on the other. I can go ahead and add to the selected scope and I click save. So what happens is it the, once I create this assignment, this policy will be applied at the tenant root level, but it will exclude my particular subscription that I have selected here. I can enforce my policy or not. If I select disabled, it will be similar to the audit effect. I can keep it enabled. You can change the name of the person who is who has assigned the policy. You can change the assignment name to anything that you would prefer. And then if you will click next to here is where it will ask you to provide the list of the SKUs or provide the parameter values. Since I had a list of parameter where uh, list of allowed SKUs, which is a list of the sizes of virtual machines, I can choose any one of them or whatever works for my organizational standards. I can click next since this is a deny effect. I really don't need a remediation step, but as I said for a couple of the effects we might need a remediation step as well. In those cases, we can add a remediation step here. For the time being, I will just skip it. And if I go and create, click on create here, it will go ahead and it will it will assign that on my scope. Oops. So what happened? So here you see the assignment has been made on the resource on the tenant root management group. It was assigned by me. If I go ahead and look into assignments tab, it will show that my policy has been applied on the tenant root group. I can head out to compliance tab where you can see that my uh, policy shows here. It, it has still not started evaluation, which takes around I believe 30 minutes or so before it starts uh, giving the results of the compliance. But once it supplies it, this is how it gives a status of whether it's compliant, it's compliant or not compliant. If it is non compliant, uh, how many resources are compliant, how many resources are not. For example, in this it says 
overall resource compliance is zero non-compliant resources two out of two. Similar to uh, policies, you can also choose initiatives and you can, for example, Microsoft has uh, built in initiative for NIST attestation, NIST SP800-171, and it has already grouped all the required, uh, all the recommended policies within the initiative. And as, rather than applying each one of those policies independently, I can go ahead and assign the complete initiative on the scope on the same lines as I was showing for the policy earlier. All right, let's let's start with Azure Role Based Access Control. Under Azure Resource Manager, uh, the access control mechanism that's offered by Microsoft is based on roles. Uh, role Based Access Control helps manage who has access to Azure resources, what they can do with those resources, and what areas they have access to. There are some built-in roles like owner, reader, contributor, and so on. Likewise, you can have your own custom roles defined as well, similar to policies. So role-based access control is applied to any security principle, including a user, a group, or a service principle. And again, um, if you have used Azure AD in the past, don't mix these roles with Azure AD roles. These roles apply to Azure resources and are not the same as Azure AD roles, which apply at the tenant level. So under Azure AD, uh, we have roles like Global Administrator, as you can see on the top left corner. We have roles like Global Administrator, Application Administrator, who have scope, who have permissions at the tenant level, Azure AD tenant level scope, whereas the Azure role, RBAC roles, applies at the resource levels or at the management group or subscription or resource group level. Before Azure Resource Manager was introduced, there was a different deployment model known as Azure Service Management model. It is now called as Classic Model. Under the Classic Model, they had roles like Service Administrators and Co-Administrators. That is what you see here. They still reflect in Azure Portal. If you will head out to your subscription, you can still see Co-Administrators in list or Service Administrators listed in there. Along with role based access control roles for each of your subscription, you will notice. Uh, uh, the account admins who are responsible for paying the bill for your subscription, I will show sh show it shortly in a demo. Similar to policies, the roles that you assign at a particular scope is inherited uh, under with the underlying resources. For example, if a user is assigned a role in the root management group here, the permissions are inherited by the underlying scopes. Likewise, if I assign permissions at a non at the non production management group, the permissions are inherited down in that hierarchy and not in the production management group. Continuing that the more refined the scope is, the permissions are assigned to the appropriate scope. In this case, the uh, permissions are applied at the subscription level and are not inherited by any other subscriptions in the same or different management groups. Let me jump onto the Azure portal and show it to you. And I now remember what I was trying to show earlier in policies and I forgot. If I go ahead in definitions, I can actually go ahead and create my own custom policy or my custom initiative. I can click on policy definition. I can choose a location where it should go. Let's say I want it to be in tenant root group. I can give a name for my custom policy. I can provide a description which I can skip right now. I can create a new category or I can choose an existing one. And here is where I can define my JSON for the policy. And once I create save, it appears here under custom custom policy type and I can literally do the same thing that I have shown you through a built in policy type. Anyway, jumping on to role based access control, let me go to my tenant root group. So here in any Azure resource type, you will see an access control or IAM blade on the left side through which you can assign these Azure role based access control roles. Uh, at this moment, I'm in tenant root group. So if you will see here, I can go under role assignments where I have a couple of users already added. 
uh, as a user access administrator, I can click on add and I can add role assignment. I can choose my user and I can choose a particular role. It could be owner, contributor, reader, or any of the existing roles. It could be owner, contributor, reader are more towards the subscription and resource groups and management group level, but we can also have resource specific built in roles like a VM operator who can operate a virtual machine or a website contributor who can contribute towards a website resource and so on. So you can see all different category of resource specific roles as well. For now, let me make the particular user as a contributor and save it. And here you see that the user has been added as a contributor on this particular scope. You can see the scope is this resource. Now my management group has different uh, this management groups and subscriptions under that. So if I will go under my management group, which is a nested management group in the tenant root group. I, if I go here, I can see that my permissions have been inherited that I have added on the tenant root group as a contributor, and you can see it has been inherited. Likewise, if I go inside my subscription and assign to a resource group, You can see at a subscription level you have access control i am if i go ahead and assign a role at the subscription level it is in it is uh, inherited by the underlying resource groups if i go inside a resource group i can go here i can assign access control and same same kind of ui same level of permissions i can assign at different scopes the one thing that i was mentioning was about uh, the classic administrators. This is where you can see since this is my user who owns this subscription. I can go ahead and I can add a co administrator which can be added at the subscription level. Certainly not at the resource group level. So if I go here, I can add a subscription co administrator here. Which will go and fall under classic administrators. So though Microsoft doesn't recommend doing that anymore. Microsoft recommends utilizing role based access control, which gives you more refined control over who can control who can access your resources and what they can do with what. You can add your custom role as well with different permissions. You can provide dif add different category of permissions and have your own custom role. For example, if you want to club multiple built in roles rather than assigning the user three, four different built in roles, you can merge the, all those permissions into a new custom role and assign users to that particular custom role. Moving on, we have touched upon uh, resource hierarchies. We have touched upon Azure policies, Azure role based access control. Let's talk about Azure blueprints. Azure blueprints allow us to define a repeatable set of uh, resources like uh, our back or policy assignments that through which we can enforce organizational standards, patterns and requirements. Essentially, Azure Blueprints make it possible for teams to rapidly provision new environments with trust they are building within organizational compliance with a set of built in components such as networking, speed up, development, and delivery. Blueprint offer a declarative way to orchestrate the deployment of role based access control, the role assignments, the policy assignments. We can have ARM templates through which we can deploy different resources and the resource group. Uh, I will show a demo which will give a picture of how blueprints uh, look like, but essentially for every blueprint, there is, it's a two step life cycle. The first step is to create and edit that blueprint for meaning what role assignments, what policy assignments, what ARM templates and what resource groups are part of blueprints. When we create and define that, we can then publish them so that it can create or provision those environments based on our specifications. I am really concerned about blueprints at this moment because blueprints is under preview right now, as you can see here, and I generally don't recommend utilizing preview features, but blueprints has been out there since over a year now, and I have been waiting for them to go GA. I don't have any uh, guideline on when they might be going GA, but they are very powerful. As I said, 
there it's a two step process. You create and define your blueprints and then you assign your blueprints. So if I go ahead and click on blueprint, I can either use and similar to policies. I can use an built in blueprint from here or I can go ahead and create a blank blueprint. Let me give it a name test blueprint. Similar to policies, I can define a location here. Let's say I want it to sit in the tenant root group or. Let's say. Then I can select the artifacts that I want. For example, in this particular example, uh, I can choose. A policy assignment. I want, let's say. Uh, let me choose one of these policies. Let's say Azure backups should be enabled for virtual machines. I can add a role assignment. For example, if I want a contributor and I can either opt to provide this value at the time of blueprint assignment or I can go ahead and assign it now itself. I will leave it for providing at the assignment time and click add. Likewise, I can go ahead and create if I don't have a ARM template ready right now, but if I want initial set of resources to be provisioned within that subscription or within that environment, I can provide an ARM template here and as, as part of the blueprint, assi blueprint assignment, it will take that ARM template and provision those resources for me automatically. Likewise, I can also opt to create a resource group here. I can provide a name here and click on add and it will create a resource group for me in there. So what essentially happens here is if I leave it as is it wherever it is, it's assigned to it will apply a policy and it will as well as create a user that I will provide at the assignment time as, as the contributor on there. So Casey has asked the question, how relevant would you say blueprints are to an organization that use Azure DevOps pipelines for deployments that typically deploy JSON templates through pipelines? I think they are very uh, relevant. Uh, Azure blueprints are, in my opinion, are not for the use cases where we have to deploy our codes or def deploy our uh, databases from uh, Azure DevOps. These are for creating your landing zones. Uh, for example, if I have a shared environment or a shared subscription where I have all my networking resources or if I have a, a subscription that I want to spin up with upfront policy assignments and upfront uh, role based access control roles, I can utilize blueprints in that scenario. But for day to day deployments through Azure DevOps pipelines, I think blueprints is not for that purpose. So I hope that answers your question. Moving on, another uh, great construct for uh, governance is called as Azure Resource Graph. Uh, it's a good platform which can be used for resource exploration. You, if you have used Azure Monitor in the past, you would have already seen Custo Query language. So using resource graphs, you can query your Azure resources using a similar query language that is based out of Custo Query language. You can query your resources, you can filter them, you can sort them, you can group them based on their properties. You can create dashboards based on your resource graph queries similar to the one that I'm showing you here. You can save those queries, share it with your team and do whatsoever. I can probably jump into the Azure portal to give you a quick demo around that. So here I have a resource graph explorer where you can see on the left side they have different tables that has all the resource graphs that you have. So by default, that default table that it uses is resources. If I click here, if I run it here, it will list all the resources that I'm that I have in my Azure environment. I can go ahead and filter it. Where uh, let's say location equal to central US. So I can filter all my uh, resources which are based out of central US. I can further do and kind equal to storage. So I have two different storage accounts. If I go ahead and 
since I was saying resources is the default table, I don't need to specify resources there. I, if I directly run where location equal to central US and kind equal to storage, it will still give me the same result because by default it runs the queries on the resources table. Likewise, if I go in there and run query for resource containers, it gives me a list of my subscriptions and resource groups. I can go ahead and filter it based on the types. As you can see here, it lists my subscriptions or resource groups here. Uh, one thing you can do here is, as I was saying, you can filter, sort, and group your resources based on the query, but you can also see charts on top of it. For example, I have a query here that I'm going to show. So what it basically does is it shows a count uh, of all the resources in my subscriptions and sort them by location and then it gives the location the total count of the resources and then order them by count. So this is typically what it shows. I have 23 resources running in central US, eight are global resources, four are running in south central, a couple of them are in east US and I have one resource running in west India. Now, if you will notice here, you have a charts tab here. If I go here and if I go and choose a bar chart, it does gives me that in a good uh, chart that I can see. Now I can go ahead and I can pin it to my dashboard. I can create a private dashboard or I can use a shared dashboard. I can go ahead and create a new uh, dashboard altogether. Once I have that dashboard, I can see under my dashboard section here. You can save each of these queries uh, and you, as private queries or shared queries. Once you have saved your queries, you can go back and again open those queries. I would strongly recommend you to go ahead and check out resource graph explorer base sample dashboards. I had downloaded it from a uh, couple of GitHub repositories earlier. I was not able to unfortunately find the links for that, but if you will do a Google search, I'm pretty sure you will be able to find people who have published rich interactive dashboards based on these resource graph uh, explorer queries, which are very interactive, which they in under which they give uh, views like the total number of resources running in your environment, total number of virtual machines, total number of resources in particular location, total number of tags and whatsoever. Very powerful tool. Moving on, uh, when we speak of uh, Azure governance, uh, certainly Azure cost is uh, certainly an aspect of that governance model because anything that you deploy in Azure costs you. Uh, I sometimes wonder why we call cloud as pay as you go model because it's not pay as you go, it's for not as it's not pay as you consume. It's basically pay as what you configure. So the moment you go ahead and configure certain resource in Azure, they start billing you irrespective of if you are consuming that resource or not. For example, if I create a virtual machine of a specific size, even if I'm not using it, I'm still paying for it because it is pay as you configure. It's the resources, compute resources are already configured and provisioned and I'm being built for that. So it's high, very critical to have a view, have a dashboard where you can monitor your Azure costs. And Azure Cost Management actually provides that one-stop dashboard within Azure Portal to give you that clear snapshot of your current Azure cost. And you can also see your forecasted costs within your Azure environments. So in the Cost Management Dashboard, as you can see in this uh, a screenshot you can see the actual cost which is dark green then it automatically shows the forecasted cost as well for example in this particular example my actual cost as of today is 27.92 but the forecasted cost it says 43.42 we can further filter them based on each resource based on location based on services and so on it's as you can see, it's a it gives a clear picture of my Azure cost. You you can refine the filters on the top, as I was saying, to see the cost for different time frames, resources, and so on. I will show a quick demo of this in a moment. And uh, it, here are different uh, category of costs that you can see within cost management dashboards. You can see forecasted costs from one month to twelve month in the future. 
you can see costs by resources to find out the most expensive resources in your environment. You can see daily costs to discover anomalies in your daily usage of Azure. You can compare costs for each service for past three months. Finally, you can also see invoice details as well for your Azure environment. You can directly go to cost management. I will show in a demo anyways, but you can go to the cost management blade in Azure portal directly, or you can actually go to a specific resource group or a subscription and go to cost analysis blade for that resource to analyze the cost for those for the specific scope. I will show it show that to you in a moment. Uh, speaking of Azure cost, another construct that you should be aware of are known as tax which help you organize your Azure resources into taxonomy. For example, I can tag all my resources belonging to my HR application with a tag indicating the resource belongs to HR. Tags can be applied to subscriptions, resource groups, or individual resources. Do note that tags are case insensitive. Some of the examples of tags I can suggest are cost center, environment, owner, department, and so on. Uh, I have listed a link down below where uh, Microsoft has published a tagging decision guide. Not only tagging, but Microsoft has published naming stand naming guidance as well based on how you should name and tag your Azure resources in your environment. I would strongly encourage you to go ahead and check that tagging decision guide. It's very helpful. Speaking of managing Azure cost, you should always check your costs upfront in Azure pricing calculator before provisioning the resources. You can add multiple services. You can save and export estimates for later reference. You can choose the offer type to reflect the right pricing as well. I will show you a quick demo in a moment. And when speaking of managing Azure cost, another service that comes very handy is Azure Advisor. It's a free service offered by Microsoft, which provides recommendations on how you can optimize your Azure costs and not only costs. As you can see on the uh, slide, it gives recommendations on how you can make your environment more secure, highly available and performant. And if you will uh, click on any one of those uh, sections there, you can actually drill down into each of uh, those specific recommendations. Do check it out if you haven't checked uh, Azure Advisor. There are a few gems hidden out there through which you can save down your costs and may improve your overall Azure environment. Let me go into cost management devoutly pretty quickly. So I'm into my subscription. I will go inside one of my subscriptions. And as I was saying, for subscriptions and for resource groups, you have a cost analysis tab there. So if I go ahead and click on cost analysis, it gives me a clear picture as I was showing in my slide deck. It gives me a clear picture of where, how it is headed to, what's my current cost and how it is forecasted. Since it, I don't have uh, more than 10 days of data, it doesn't showcase this forecasted data for me, but if you have more than 10 days of data, you will get forecasted cost as well. You can go and choose based on different uh, views. You can ch change your views to different available options for example different cost by resource daily costs and so on you can also go ahead and choose different time spans here you can utilize last invoice last three invoices last seven days last 30 days last month last year last quarter and so on or you can also have custom you can choose a custom date range and you can get data for that you can also do group your uh, chart based on the uh, different parameters here. You can go ahead and group based on the available tags. You can group and base them on the resource type. You can change the granularity level for your uh, data. You can make it daily, monthly, or accumulated. You can change the chart type. For By default, it uses column stacked, but you can use area chart or a line chart and so on. Go ahead and choose the appropriate scope. I can choose the management group or any other subscription and get the cost analysis for that particular scope. One thing that I didn't uh, touched upon in my uh, slide decks in the cost management section is budgets, which is a good way where you can assign a threshold amount value to your uh, Azure spend. And based on that, you can actually trigger certain type of alerts and actions 
if someone breaches the threshold amount value for example you if some if you have set a budget of $500 for a particular resource group or a subscription you can set up alerts on top of it if someone breaches 90% if someone has already spent 90% of that spend in azure you can send an alert to the person or you can actually trigger a webhook which goes ahead and deletes those resources or disable those resources shut down the machines or whatsoever so do check it out very powerful tool um, you can as i was said saying you can go to a subscription and see cost analysis and budget you can go inside a resource group and you can go ahead and see the cost analysis there as well likewise you can also go in cost management and billing blade directly and you can go ahead and choose the scope where you want to run your literally the same uh, dashboard that's available inside each of these scopes that I was showing earlier. Moving on, uh, another good feature you should be aware of is resource logs. It's very important to understand the use case for resource logs. As the Azure environment goes, uh, you might have resources which are critical and you, you might not like people to either go ahead and modify them or probably delete them. You can log those resources through something known as resource logs, which prevents accidental deletion or modification. There are two types of log levels. You delete logs or read only. So uh, using delete logs, it allow it prevents user from deleting the underlying resources. Read only uh, using read only log users can only read a resource but cannot delete or modify it. It's critical, especially in scenarios where you have shared resources like your hub and spoke networks and your other shared resources. Only owner or someone with a user access administrator permissions can create or delete resource logs. I would like to encourage and encourage to go and check about Azure Security Center, which is a unified infrastructure security management system offered by Azure that you can use to strengthen the security posture of your environment. The one good feature that I really like is the secure score that you see on the topmost where it evaluates your security posture of your environment and runs the relevant security policies and gives you a score of where your environment stands. Uh, you can utilize the existing policies that we have talked about earlier and security center also comes with some additional policies that you can in include in your security center compliance now all the azure services comes with certain slas and you cannot rule out outages and downtimes like any other cloud provider azure also see outages or unavailability in some of the services sometimes you can check the latest status of availability of Azure services across different regions in Azure status dashboard. In a, it's a generalized view for all the customers. If everything is up and running, it shows a green tick mark, just like how you can see it on the slide. Likewise, if there is a planned maintenance and no downtime is warranted, it might show up as information. Sometimes the outage may impact only a subset of customers and not everyone. In such cases, it shows warning. In the case of complete outage, when the service is down for everyone, it shows critical. It is a very handy tool in my opinion. Still, Microsoft takes some time to update the status on this status page, primarily because the moment there is an outage, they start investigation and it takes some time for them to analyze the overall impact of the outage and update this page. If you ever experience an outage in Azure environment, I would highly encourage you to go ahead and look into the feed of our Azure support in Twitter. Uh, if there is an outage, you will certainly find few other people mentioning about that on their on Azure supports Twitter feed. Uh, if Microsoft has concluded it's it's an outage, the status will be updated here as well. And Microsoft, as you can see towards the right top right side, status history and root cause analysis. Microsoft does publishes the details for the past outages and their root cause analysis. If you're not sure of your SLAs for different Azure services, you can check it out as well. If you need a more personalized service health status that reflects impact on your Azure environment specifically, head out to the Azure Service Health within the Azure portal, which is a service offered free of cost, which reflects that. So as I was saying, using uh, this is how Azure Service Health dashboard looks like into uh, in Azure portal. Using Azure Service Health, you can stay informed and act quickly on service issues. 
Azure Service Health notifies you about Azure service incidents and planned maintenance, so you can take action to mitigate downtime. As depicted in the picture, you can review active incidents, planned maintenance, and health advisories in a personalized dashboard for a service health based on your Azure subscriptions and uh, services. You can uh, further send alerts through email, SMS, push notification, webhook, and so on. And you can also integrate it with ITSM tool of your choice like ServiceNow. Uh, Karthik has asked some questions. He says, suppose if we enable resource lock on a resource group and the resource group has SQL Server database. Using Azure DevOps pipeline, if we have a post deployment script to delete a table, then we are getting an error because of the lock. How to handle this scenario? by enforcing logs. Uh, I believe if you have a resource lock at a resource group level, that resource lock will apply at the SQL database level, but it won't block you from deleting a table within a SQL database, but I might be mistaken and I might have to check it out. Um, does anyone has any idea on that? My understanding is it won't impact Karthik, so have you seen in the past, have you tried implementing it and have you seen that cannot delete log blocks you from deleting a table from a SQL database? Yes. Uh, so if I'm physically going and deleting on the table, uh, it, it's not uh, restricting, but Azure DevOps is restricting. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Probably I'll check it out and see what I can find out. I'll let you know. Uh, same with the uh, same with the Azure service bus. I think I cannot delete a topic. I guess I think I can delete messages, but not topic. And um, that's interesting. That might be probably when we are doing it through ARM templates within Azure DevOps pipeline. Probably it might be considering each one of them as a unique resource type, and that might be blocking it. But I will I'll check it out. I'll let you know what I find. I'll probably post it on this user groups Slack channel. Sure. Uh, yeah, with that, I'm almost done with my presentation. Here are some of the resources that you can refer to. Uh, most of them are published by Microsoft, starting from Azure Governance Link, where they have listed different solutions for how you can govern your Azure environment. Then Azure Architecture Center and Cloud Adoption Framework are two other resources which are very helpful in designing and architecting your uh, Azure environment altogether. Do check out Azure Trust Center if you have any compliance requirements for setting up your Azure environment. Uh, tagging decision guide I did mention in one of the slide decks, uh, slides earlier, uh, which gives the tagging and naming guidance on how you should be tagging and naming your Azure resources. Pricing calculator, I have shown a slide uh, on that. Do go and check it out, it's pretty cool. And likewise, there is another calculator for total cost of ownership that you can also utilize for calculating uh, the total expense for your Azure environment. With that, I can open the forum for question and answers. All right, uh, thank you so much.